In the Premier League, it's not unusual to see Wolves and Toffees face off during a weekend of action. In the wild, there would be arguably one clear winner. And to be honest, at the time of writing, there would be on the pitch as well. But where did English football clubs get their unusual nicknames? We're going to look at the most unique and finish with what I think is the strangest. But let's start with the Gunners, Arsenal. Now, Arsenal might be based in London, but that's not why they earned this violent nickname. Arsenal was originally called the not-so-catchy Dial Square Football Club, being named after a workshop in the middle of the factory that the team was formed in way back in 1886. This was the Royal Arsenal Factory in Woolwich, London, and it's no surprise to hear what they made. Guns. Lots of guns. In those days, they didn't have pacey French imports with va No, they were all munitions workers. The name of the club changed multiple times over the years from Royal Arsenal, Woolwich Arsenal, The Arsenal, and now just Arsenal. But the nickname remained, and the Gunners proudly display their heritage on their chest. And next, a nickname that came from a slightly less obvious origin story. The Bees, Brentford. Now, you would have thought that a club named The Bees might play in yellow and black, but with their red and white stripes, you'd be right in thinking that their nickname has a slightly more obscure reason for being. It actually came from a group of students, which goes to show that students are capable of more than just nothing. But then the name did come from a mistake, so we shouldn't give them too much credit. During the 1894-95 season, the media misquoted a group of students from Borough Road College. They would turn up to games to support their friend, striker Joe Gettins. The group would chant from the stand, Buck up Bees! the school's war cry. This could have referred to Brentford or more likely Borough for the college. Either way, it definitely wasn't calling for the hive, but that didn't stop reporters from thinking it was some sort of quirky term of endearment and dubbing the club the Honeymakers. Well, over a hundred years later, they still have the name. The Bees, not the Honeymakers. The Toffees, Everton. Now, Toffees aren't the best thing for a footballer's diet. It will stop them shouting slurs at the referee, but it's the basis for an entire club identity in Everton's case. There are two reasons why they have this name, and both of them are sweet shops. It starts with the Everton Toffee Shop owned by Molly Bushell. This was near Anfield, where Everton started their journey. Yes, believe it or not, Everton used to rent out Liverpool's hallowed turf for £100 a year. This was before they moved to Goodison Park in 1892. Another local toffee seller became popular when the brilliantly named Mother Noblet's Toffee Shop started giving fans a sweet tooth. They even had a USP with a new type of toffee that included white stripes of sugar, which remains popular among Everton fans now. Legends say that good old Molly Bushell didn't give up, despite the move, and managed to earn the right to sell her iconic toffees at Goodison Park as well. The Cherries, AFC Bournemouth. Some names strike fear into opposing fans, but the Cherries just sounds pleasant. No matter how many times they beat some of the best teams in the country, they just can't seem to shift the attitude that they're punching above their weight, and maybe it's partly down to their nickname. There's two schools of thought on where this comes from. Either the obvious one, which is the cherry red they play in, along with their AC Milan-style black stripes, or the more abstract reason, which was the proximity of their Dean Court Stadium to a massive cherry orchard in the neighbouring area of Cooper Dean. Either way, it's a lot nicer than the disturbing-sounding nickname we'll end the video with. We'll get to that later, but next we're looking at another smaller Premier League club, or at least they were when this video was made. The Hatters, Luton. Unsurprisingly, Luton aren't called this because their fans love Alice in Wonderland. This is another one connected to industry. As far back as the 17th century, Luton was a booming centre for the hat-making trade. At one point, pretty much the whole town was involved in making hats, and its residents made it rain with the straw hat trade. The town had more straw than a horse's inappropriate dream, and Luton's finely woven hats were a major attraction, which put the town on the map. Now, straw hats aren't quite the booming trade it used to be, but that hasn't stopped the football club leaving a reminder of that thriving industry on their the Villains, Aston Villa. At first, this one might seem self-explanatory. It's a simple play on words, right? Well, yes, you are right. Well done. But there's more to it than that. The term villain, spelt without the second I, was presumed to be a misspelling, but it was actually a phrase coined to describe a Villa fan way back in the late 19th century by pioneering programme editor Jack Urry. Cartoonist Tom Webster animated the character of the same name in around 1905. He was a railway booking clerk who won a newspaper cartoon contest in 1904 and then joined the Evening Dispatch and the Sports Argus. He'd go on to join the Daily Mail and become friends with Arsenal manager Herbert Chapman. The villain would then live on through Norman Edwards, one of Webster's successors at the Evening Dispatch and Sports Argus. The villain would make cameos in football cigarette cards issued by Sweetall Products in 1959, a 1968 fan publication called The Villazine, and in the 1986 Panini sticker book depicting the mustachioed man having tied up an opposition player. Of course, this was well before the days when people did things like this for fun. The Eagles, Crystal Palace. 
Most of the nicknames we've looked at so far have had their roots buried under the murky patio of history, but Palace's name is relatively new and ended up inspiring another name we'll look at next. They changed their identity from Glazers to the Eagles in 1974. I'm sure a lot of Man United fans wish they could do a similar thing with their club. It was part of manager Malcolm Allison's plan to bring the club up to date, with a change of kit colours and a nickname inspired by Portuguese side Benfica, with a new badge depicting an eagle holding a ball. And around this time a new rivalry was brewing that would spill over and change another club's identity. The Seagulls, Brighton and Hove Albion. Only a few years after Palace changed their crest, the name Brighton did the same. This wasn't a coincidence. After avoiding each other previously due to being in different leagues, like flares and wheelie bins, the two started to meet each other more frequently in the 70s. Some ill-tempered matches meant that despite having a 50-mile gap between stadiums, the two clubs started an unconventional rivalry, which peaked when a Brighton manager is thought to have thrown coins on a pitch in front of the Palace fans saying, this is what your club is worth. Just before then, a game between the two had Brighton fans chanting seagulls in response to the newly formed eagles that the Palace fans have been singing about. To change a club's whole look just to spice another tells you pretty much everything you need to know about English football. The Hammers, West Ham. Now, this is an easy one. Nope. The name The Hammers has nothing to do with West Ham, because when the club was founded, it had a completely different name. This was Thames Ironworks FC. Just like Arsenal, the club has evolved over the years and was born out of industry, and this explains why West Ham are known either as The Hammers or The Irons. Both relate to the products the players would have been making at the time, and explains why the club crest features two crossed hammers. The club wasn't just representing itself as a couple of tools. The Red Devils, Manchester United. Man United have taken many guises over the years, for example, they used to be good. From their early days as Newton Heath, they were nicknamed the Heathens, through to just United after their early 20th century rebrand. Then their current name was coined by legendary manager Sir Matt Busby. He wanted to distance the club from the Busby Babes team that was tragically involved in a plane crash in 1958. He took inspiration from local rugby team Salford that had toured in France and were labelled Les Diables Rouges or the Red Devils by the press because of their red shirts. The club badge was then redesigned in 1970 to feature a prancing devil and become one of the most well-known crests in world football. The Blades, Sheffield United. Even though Sheffield United have had all the sharpness of a knob of butter this season, they named the Blades because of more industrial heritage. The city is famous for its steel industry and producing cutlery. This is why the nickname was used for both United and their rival Sheffield Wednesday in their early years. Sheffield United actually had the name The Cutlers from 1889 to 1912, but when Wednesday vacated their Blades moniker in 1907, their rivals decided to steal it, excuse the pun, and they still use it now. Monkey Hangers, Hartlepool. Although Hartlepool aren't a Premier League club, an honourable mention has to go to the Northeastern team for their ridiculous nickname of Monkey Hangers. Legend has it during the Napoleonic Wars of the early 19th century, a shipwrecked monkey was hanged by the people of Hartlepool because they thought the primate was a French spy. Someone should have probably told them that the information would have been difficult to translate, as as far as I know, the people of France don't speak monkey. To this day, people from Hartlepool are affectionately known as Monkey Hangers and the football club adopted it for themselves.